So it's one of those mornings, one of those mornings that I'm sure we've all had, we've all had experience at some time in our life where you just don't want to get out of bed. Not because you're exhausted from the weekend before or whatever, or you're cozy and it's cold, but because you just don't want to face the day. You're wide awake and your stomach is just in knots and twisting and turning and you have this nervousness that is just not going away. It's one of those mornings. All you can think about are the faces that you're going to interact with throughout the day. Sure, they're smiling. Sure, they're giving their, their best, but it's, it's in the eyes that you see the hatred. You see their hatred for you. It's one of those mornings where you finally get the strength to get out of bed and your feet hit a very nice rug. Not a dirt floor, a rug. You look around your room and you see that you have it all. You've got all the toys, everything that you've ever wanted in life. You have it. You've won at the game of life. But whatever, what's going on inside is screaming that it's not the same. It's not matching up. You should feel better. You should be enjoying these things. But it's another day. He goes into the bathroom. He looks himself in the mirror. And he says, how did this happen? How did I let this get to this point? I'm stuck. So he wipes his tears, puts on his nicely ornate robe, couple gold rings, walks out of his house, is now surrounded by his own personal bodyguards, and walks to his job, where he will spend all day collecting taxes from people. Tax man, it's not like we are very fond of them today, but it was even worse back then. And this is where we find Jesus. This is where he is now going to interact with one of the most hated, despised people in the land. Have you been there? Have you had those moments of what happened? This isn't the life I wanted to live. This isn't, this isn't how I saw things going 10, 20 years ago. How did I let this happen? Getting so stuck that you feel that you've ruined your life. But this is where we see Jesus, like I said. This is one of my favorite stories because it shows us who Jesus is. It shows us who we are to him, and it shows us how he can use us. It's a remarkable story, one of my favorites. I know I say that with all the stories. But open up your Bibles. We're going to be in Luke chapter 5, verse 27. The story is the story of Matthew or Levi. It's the same person. They're both sons of Alphaeus. One's the Greek name, one's the Hebrew name. Same person. So if your Bible says Levi, you're in the right spot. If it says Matthew, you're in the right spot too. So verse 27 is where we are, and this is where we'll start. After this, okay, time out. I cannot go any further. After what? What just happened? The Bible's telling us, look, you need to pay attention. Before we go any further, you need to pay attention of what just happened before. After this, then what? And it was two remarkable healings that Jesus got to do. So real quick, we have to go there before we understand and go any further. What happened? The first was the healing of a leper. First century leprosy was a death sentence. And it wasn't this thing that you're going to, you know, die and you'll have loved ones. You are dying 100% complete alone, slowly, 
painfully. You had to live, the minute you get leprosy, there are all these rules that you have to live by, which makes sense because they didn't have the medicine back then. It all makes sense. It's sad, but it's true. You couldn't go into the markets, and if you did, you had to scream to the top of your lungs, unclean, unclean. Imagine going into a Target and just sharing your business, <laughs> right? Unclean, unclean. You were on the outskirts. You couldn't go to church. You couldn't do this. You couldn't do anything. You couldn't be around people because you will spread your disease. And so when this man, he hears of the stories of Jesus, he hears all that Jesus has been doing from town to town. He knows that he's in his area, so he runs breaking a rule, mind you, runs to Jesus, falls on his knees, and says, if you can, make me clean. I love that word because it's not heal me, it's make me clean, almost as if he has taken the identity of something other than, then, other than what he should be, and he has just accepted his disease. Make me clean. And Jesus, this, <laughs> that's what I love about Jesus right here. Never, hardly, do, will you ever read that he healed the same person twice? Why? Because he knows exactly what you need. And so he placed his hand on the leper, a big no-no, and touches the man who has not been touched since his disease. We know now, we now know what it's like to go without physical touch. It's needed. We need that to survive. And Jesus gives out of the compassion his heart. He heals this man and is now clean. It is the compassion of Jesus that he just didn't say, okay, yeah, you're clean. See you later. No, he touches him. We cannot lose the fact that he did that. Now, you can't touch an unclean person, but Jesus could argue, well, when I touched him, he was clean. Chicken or the egg. <laughs> Who knows? Healing number two. Again, Jesus has this following. People are hearing his stories. He decides to, he, <clears throat> he goes to a town. And while he's there, a city official says, hey, can you speak at my house? Jesus says, sure. But word gets out that the man is here. So all the marketplaces, all the works, everything's closing in early. And people are running to get to this house to hear the words of this man that is changing everything. And four men, on their way to go hear Jesus, stop and say, you know who needs to hear this? Our paralyzed friend. But, but we're going to miss out on the good seats. I know, but we need to get our friend here. And so they go, they pick him up, and they said, guys, guys, relax. It's okay. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a cripple. I'm not, I've accepted my life. It's okay. No, we're going to take you. And so they take the paralyzed friend, they construct a, a stretcher, and they take him. And when they get to the house, they see defeat. Because now it's like hundreds of people. They're not going to get this guy in front of Jesus. Ah, good try, guys. I really appreciate it. I know your heart's in the right place, but it's okay. Just take me back to my mat. Hey, there's no one on the roof. And so they hoist the guy up there, and while they're up there, they rip the thatch open. A beam of light shines down. There's dust particles everywhere, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again. I don't care how good of a teacher Jesus was. That is a distraction, and it stops everything in that moment. They lower the guy in front of him. Jesus looks at the four friends, one, two, three, four, looks at the man in front of him and says, because of your faith, your sins are forgiven. Jesus used the law to heal that man. Because here's the deal. As soon as Jesus said that, the Pharisees started finger wagging and complaining. Instead of celebrating the miracle and the foot race that is now happening outside, they are complaining that this man shouldn't have healed them in that way. I don't care if that guy's now walking. You, 
did a no-no. You're a bad person. And so those <clears throat> were the two healings that happened to now we get after this. Jesus says, look, you don't like the fact that I touched a leper, but you don't like the fact that I touched an unclean person. You don't like the fact that he's now clean and walking around. Sorry. You don't like the fact that I used the very law that was given to us as a gift to heal this man and say his sins are forgiven, and now he's walking and running with his friends. The four, the four friends are now the five friends. They do everything together. You don't like that? Oh, man, and you're really not going to like it when I go to the party. You're really not going to like it when I go to the party. Get your fingers ready. It was the compassion of Jesus that healed the man on that, the leprosy man on that day. It was the law that is a gift to us that healed the man that was paralyzed. All right, so now we know what the after this is. Let's get into it. 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at the tax booth. Okay, like I said, we know what tax collectors are, but let me tell you what tax collectors were back then. Yes, they're despised today. I, I will apologize if there's any tax collectors here or watching online. I'm sorry. But at least you're not like these guys. So first century tax collection went like this. When the Roman government conquered and took over provinces and lands and kingdoms, they decided to tax those people because they didn't want to tax their own citizens. So the Roman government sits nice and they're fine, and all the money that comes in comes from other people. And also the Roman government says, hey, we don't want to be taxmen because no one likes a taxman. We want you guys to do it. And so they will go to a province or an area and say, okay, so we got this area marked out. How, who wants to be a taxman? A couple people raise their hand and says, okay, how much money do you think you can get from this area? Well, I can get about 30000 Okay. Anyone get more than 30,000? I could probably get about 40 and 50 and 60 and 70. Someone says, I can get 100,000. So you are now the taxman of this area. You now have the power and might of the Roman government behind you. If anyone gives you lip, you can talk to these guys. You now have to give the Roman government $100,000 every month. And whatever you collect after that, well, you can keep. It's you. Good deal? Yeah, that's a great deal. Bodyguards, money. So the truth is, a well-off, rich tax collector was a hated tax collector. Because not only, I mean, it's, think of it. For any young man who doesn't want to be a fisherman, a carpenter, a shepherd, a rabbi, or maybe wasn't taught traits or really was just kind of lost in life, this is an intriguing offer, right? Like fast, quick money. There's nothing wrong with getting fast, quick money unless there's a huge cost to it. And so what was the cost? Well, once Matthew now got the job, he says, okay, I'll do it. I'm the tax man. Wow, I'm going to have more money than my dad ever had. I'm going to be well off. Well, now you can be a judge or a witness in the Jewish community, which is, okay, you get no jury duty. That's fine. No big loss. Except for it wasn't like that. It was the character of the person. You no longer have character. You have no moral standing. You can't even defend yourself if someone makes an accusation to you because now we all know that your character is always in question. You've lost it because he was excommunicated from his synagogue. Every social, every um, community aspect revolved around the church. Every festival, every party revolved around the church. And now you've lost it. You're done. Your family, your family has a choice. They can either disown you or we can excommunicate them as well. You can, you're a disgrace to your family, 
your community. You could not marry. You could never own a successful business. You are cut off. You're going to be rich. You're going to have power. But you are cut off, and you will forever be known as an outcast and a sinner. Enjoy your money. Which I sympathize, because they're turning their back on their people, and they're robbing them. I get it. But I've also made a lot of decisions based on money myself that didn't turn out quite right. I know I've made a lot of bad decisions in my life that had major consequences down the road. So it happens. It's the trap. And when Matthew has finally realized that, and as time has gone on, he hears the stories of Jesus. He hears about what he has come to do, he, about how he's teaching uh, you know, these new religious teachings that are you know, familiar, but also new. Things are changing in him. He's realizing he made a mistake, and he is stuck, and he doesn't know how to get out. So one day, he sees Jesus in line. I like to imagine Jesus was in line because I don't like line cutters, and I don't think Jesus would be a line cutter. So I see that Jesus, is in, he's sitting there, he sees Jesus in line, and he goes, oh, crap, I got to take his money? But as Jesus gets closer and closer, he starts to get this exciting feeling, like, wow, this great man that I've been hearing stories about, he's actually, he has to acknowledge me. We have to have a conversation. How exciting until he gets there. And Jesus looks him in the eyes and says two words, follow me, Jesus said to him, follow me. Those words mean far far bigger, it's got a far bigger meaning than what we would think about today. Follow meaning, follow me. It's what rabbis would do to, 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 um, to people who wanted to study uh, the Torah more in depth, follow me. It's what fathers say to sons when they're te teaching them a trait, follow me. I like to imagine Matthew, just the air just gets sucked out of him. But yet he's breathing rapidly. I like to imagine like, like time just stood still in Matthew's world, but yet people are still buzzing by and yelling and screaming. It's his moment. Follow me. Not only did this man acknowledge me and talk to me and look me in the eyes, but now he's calling me into discipleship. Follow me. What a moment that we get of Jesus interacting with one of the most despised people in the land. Matthew puts down his writing utensil, takes off a couple gold rings, starts hearing the Roman soldier saying, hey, what are you doing? You come back here. You don't know what you're giving up. Where are you going? Matthew doesn't turn around. He just fixes his eyes on Jesus and walks away. It's kind of like a Cameron Crowe movie. If you guys are familiar with that, probably not. No? Okay. That joke doesn't play. They're good movies. You know, as I was preparing this lesson, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't stop and think about my own experience and, and how it was for me. In, in <clears throat> 1999, I was just a year off of losing my mom to cancer. I was a hurt, confused, angry young man because now my life is vastly different. And there are many times that I thought to myself, my life shouldn't be like this. It shouldn't be this way. I shouldn't have been one of these people. I got a bunch of like well-meaning uh, family members and neighbors that were trying to get me to be part of this uh, cancer kids who lose parents club. It was the last thing I wanted to do. It's actually a great organization, but it was the last thing I wanted to do. I wasn't, I wasn't a bad guy, but I wasn't a good guy. I wasn't the type of guy where I'd want my own daughters to be dating. 
So I was dating this girl. Sorry, Larry and Kathy. <laughs> I was dating this girl who loved Jesus. Now, I love Jesus too, but not as much as that girl did. <laughs> but I wanted that. So she was heavily involved in the youth group. She was in the youth group. And sometimes I would come at the end of youth group to, to see what she was doing because we'd go hang out later. And I would just see her interact with the kids. And I thought, how amazing is that? That is so cool. Until one day she taught at the youth group. And so I went in to saw the whole shebang and was just blown away and thought, wow, wow that is a neat thing. And then the youth pastor at the time just came up to me and said, hey, I've been seeing you at the church for the last couple months. You know, you're dating Jennifer, so you're probably a good guy. <laughs> How would you like to uh, be a youth leader? I said, well, that's probably not a good idea. <laughs> and then I unloaded on all the reasons why I shouldn't be. Well, I, I'm this, I'm that, I got all this stuff. Basically, at the end of the day, I am broken. That's my identity. I'm going to have this identity of being, you know, I use the death of my mom as an excuse for a lot of things because it became my identity. He said, okay, that's good. He said, these kids are broken too. Why don't you help them heal? Okay. I'll do it. And from that moment on, changed the direction of my life for the next 20 years, 21 years. Ooh, that's getting old. <laughs> See, when Jesus fixed his eyes on Matthew, he had that love and that compassion that Matthew didn't need a second's thought. He didn't need to think about the money he had or all the stuff he had. He was done. Now, when he had to follow, he had to leave something behind, right? Because that's the definition. If you're following, you leave something behind. And now, see, Matthew, he had, he's more than any other disciple, he had the most to lose. Why? Because he already burned his bridge with his community and with his family. He's never, he was never going to get that back, or so he thought. And, and two, now he's burning the bridge of the Roman government. He has nothing left. If Peter, James, and John decided, man, this Jesus guy is crazy. We're done. They can always go back to fishing. Matthew couldn't go back to anything. He was 100% all in because he believed in the hope, and he knew that the only hope he was ever going to have was going to be because following this man. I'm all in. Matthew was then healed and restored back into a community, back into a family. Because that's what Jesus does. It was the compassion that brought Matthew back into community relationship. Matthew was whole and now in a family again. That's what Jesus does. He restores the broken. Let us never forget. There's a lot of things that Jesus does. But let us never forget that he restores the broken. 1 Peter 5.10 says, And the God of all grace, who has called you into his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. The definition of restore is to bring back to or put back into its original state. The second definition I like a little bit better. It says to put or bring back into existence. Existence. What is the area in your life that you feel you need to bring back into existence? That you feel that it's just not even going to happen. That doesn't even belong in my thoughts. What's that area that God needs to restore in you? Here's the hope that it's never too late for God to radically change your life. There's nothing you can do it's never too late for him to radically change things. Will it be easy? No. Will all your problems go away? Sorry. No, it won't. Let's end there. See, here's the deal. 
Matthew, as he's walking with Jesus after the whole follow me thing, it's a great moment. He now has to walk to a group of disciples who probably got ripped off by Matthew. And Jesus says, hey, you guys are now in a growth group. (laughs) Work it out. Our problems won't go away. But here's the thing. God will give you the strength, the wisdom, the means, the relationship, and the words to get through it. In other words, you now have the gift of God that now walks through you in your darkest times and you never have to be alone again. That you can always rely on his strength. When you get to that moment, says, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. You're right. You probably don't. But God knows. Think about all the hard things that you've ever had to go through in your life. And then think about where it's brought you today. Because God. Never have to go it at alone. Yes, Matthew was going to have a lot of awkward conversations and probably some healing that had to be done. And when Peter saw Jesus walk up to the tax collector booth, he probably thought, oh man, you're finally going to smite this guy? He's been ripping me off for years. Let's do it. I didn't think you were going to bring him, make us friends. Jesus said, because I restore. That's what I do. Bring back into existence. Matthew wasn't alone in it, though. So probably to get out of an awkward situation, Matthew said, hey, guys, I'm the new guy. You guys like to party? Because I'm going to have one at my house tonight. You guys come. Jesus, I need you there. And this is where we get the party Jesus. Then Levi, again, it's Matthew, had a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? I love how like the Pharisees like tax collectors and sinners. You guys are all together. Yes, I'm sure there are people that broke the the law, the Ten Commandments, people that weren't good, right? But you got to understand something about what what sinners, what Pharisees considered sinners. So when Jesus, I'm sorry, when God gave us the Ten Commandments, the reason for that was to show us that we were sick people, right? Not to condemn us, not to ruin us, but just like, hey, look, you guys need help. So when help comes, take it. That's what the law is for. Well, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law said, well, you know, we don't want to mess this up. So what we're going to do is we're going to create almost like this fence around the law and come up with a bunch of other laws and religion and traditions so that we never get close to breaking your law. So consider us the most holy of people that ever walked the earth. Like God's like scratching his head. That's not, that wasn't the goal. Not for you guys to make more laws, to make it harder, to make it more inaccessible to people. And so when, you, when they consider sinners, it's people who just don't live up to their traditions and their way of thinking and their standards. Sinners. And so they asked <clears throat> Jesus that. Why are you hanging out with outcasts and bad character people? How dare you associate with them? See, <clears throat> one thing I like about this, two th- well, a couple things, is that not only did God restore Matthew, but he activated him in ministry. Matthew was like, look, you've restored me. There are people you need to meet. I have friends that are dying to hear what you have to say, that are dying to feel that compassion from you. Matthew was now activated because he knew that the only church his friends were ever going to get was at his home and not an actual church. This is their only chance. 
I just need my friends to meet you at the party. It's the four friends. It's the four friends going out of their way, sacrificing things to get their friend to appear before Jesus so that Jesus can then use the law to heal him. So I know we have this idea in culture that, and I've heard it, I've heard it many times, and to an extent I probably believed it at some point in my life, that, you know, if Jesus was here, he'd be partying. He'd be at the parties, he'd be at the clubs, he'd be at the bars. That's where Jesus would be, because Jesus, you know, he'll, he likes to party. You hear that, and you're like, yeah, but there's a but there. Yeah, but. Would Jesus be there? Probably. But you got to understand the reason. And he says the reason right here. Jesus answered them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's remembering the law. Why was the law here? To show us that we need a doctor. To show us that there, there is a sin problem in us, but God has the cure. And so when Jesus says, I've come to, for the health, not for the healthy, but the sick, it's because I'm hanging out with these people because they're sick and they know it. Why I don't hang out with you Pharisees? It's because you're sick and you don't believe it. Congratulations, you don't get a doctor. If any of us were ever told that we were sick, but yet there was a cure, we would jump on that. And Jesus says, this is why I'm here. This is why I'm at the party. So would he be at the clubs? Would he be at those things? Yes. Why? Because he wants to show him their, he wants to show them his compassion so that they too know that there's a cure. They need to know there's a cure. That's the saving grace. That's the hope. That's what we need to tell our friends and our family, that there is a cure for life. Where's the band? Band, come on up. Let's wrap this up. That's the party, Jesus. I mean, I'm sure Jesus liked to have a good time, but he wanted to show people there's a cure. You don't have to be stuck in the life that you feel like will be, never end. I'm here to re restore and activate you. This is a story of healing and ministry. It's everything what Jesus is about. Because there is no social wall, there's no social thing that Jesus won't break just to get to you. I'll break those social norms if you can realize that you need help. It's like we need to, the idea of sin, when you get wrapped up in sin, we tend to think like, oh man, God must be so disappointed. I'm going to do what I need to do. I'm going to conquer this sin. And then, so that Jesus can work in my life. We need to stop thinking like that. Because on our own, we'll never conquer it. Invite Jesus in that work. When I'm struggling with something that I can't get out, that I want to get out, but it just keeps happening, then Jesus help me. It's not this thing where the sin divides you from God. If anything, it should bring you closer He's like, look, let's do it together. Let's work it out. I have the answer. Don't let your sin divide you. I'm here to restore, to bring back into existence so that I can activate you. Why does he want to activate you? Well, restore you, to help you, so that you can be conquerors. But at the same time, you got family and friends that are probably going to have to trust the Jesus that's in you before they ever trust the Jesus in the church. You're that important. So this week, 
if you are stuck in something, if you, if you feel like there is no way out, ask God for help. Don't let that be that dividing thing. Just, God, I need help. And God will, show, will give you the strength. He'll give you the wisdom. He'll give you the means. He'll give you the relationship to conquer that. Amen? Amen. Amen.